Salaam wa Matula Ibn Katu. Shawani Bashi. Is that good? <laughs> Bismillah wa salatu wa salam ala Rasulullah Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Uh, first of all, I thank the brothers for giving me this opportunity. As the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said, if you don't thank the people, then you don't thank Allah. This is actually, if I'm not mistaken, maybe my third time um, visiting Nashville. Um, I recall a few years ago I was at the same college. If I'm not mistaken, I don't remember, but Arian told me I was here before, so I'm going to go with the flow, inshallah. But um, this is my time. This is, as I said, my second or third time here. And mashallah, tabarak Allah, so far, what I experienced from the, the community, from the brothers, from the shabab, from the youth, it's amazing, alhamdulillah. And I thank you brothers, just to start, before I start my talk, I just want to highlight that I feel that, mashallah, the community has something special. You know, even though we know there's no perfection on the earth, you know what I mean? We know that there's no community that's perfect. We know that we all have our shortcomings. But mashallah, tabarak Allah, just seeing the youth that I was able to interact with for the last couple of days, I feel they definitely have something special. Alhamdulillah, the topic of the, the talk today would be purpose of life. And many of us, like myself, you know, growing up, I didn't know the purpose of life. I didn't know what was my purpose of life. Allah tells us in the Quran that he did not create mankind and jinn except to worship him. And many of us will say, what is worship of Allah? What is worship of the creator? For those who are now Muslims here, Allah means the God, the creator of the heavens and the earth. Allah is not a mysterious God. Allah is the same word that the Jews and the Christians in the, the Middle East refer to as God. So Allah is God, in Arabic, the God. So Allah says that he did not create mankind and jinn except to worship him. And what that statement means is that it doesn't mean that we worship Allah 24-7 because we don't have the ability to do that. But as a Muslim, as those who believe in Allah, then we try our best to make every aspect of our life a worship to Allah. And that means the way, for example, the way we interact with other people, the way we do business, the way we treat our parents, the way we dress, the words that come out of our mouths, all of this for a Muslim is considered the worship. It's going to be for us or it's going to be against us. So when I grew up in North New Jersey, um, my mother and father converted to the religion of Islam before I was born. Most people don't know that I was born a Muslim, alhamdulillah. But at the age of three, my parents got murdered in front of me. And the people that killed my parents was from a group of people called the Nation of Islam. So I grew up believing that Muslims murdered my mother and father. So I grew up out of my ignorance of the religion of Islam with hatred in my heart towards Muslims. Anything with Islam, I had hatred towards it. My grandparents, my uncles, my family members, they used to install in me when I was a kid that the Muslims murdered your parents. And that's what I believe. So I grew up believing, alhamdulillah, I believed in God. I didn't follow a religion. Um, well, I did follow the religion of Christianity in my younger days. When I reached my teenager days, 13, 14 years old, I said, I don't believe in no religion, but I only believe in God. And I would say when I reached my teenage years, this was the, this was the time of my life that I started searching. I felt like something was missing. And usually when a person get into them teenage years, especially as young men and even the women nowadays, we think we know it all. But at that particular time in my life, I thought the purpose was in my life was to make money. I just wanted to be rich. You know what I mean? I wanted to get up out of the hood. Alhamdulillah, I thank Allah that even as a young age, when I started to see what was happening with everybody around me, my brothers, my relatives, my family, my brother was the biggest drug dealer in my neighborhood. My brother at one particular time was the biggest drug dealer on my block. My cousins, my uncles was the biggest gangsters in my neighborhood. So I grew up in an environment where, at a young age, I saw my brothers going in and out of jail. I saw my cousins going in and out of jail. The first time that I ever went outside on the block and tried to sell drugs, 13, 14 years old, I got arrested. I got locked up. And I remember everybody in my neighborhood was clowning me, laughing at me. Because they like, man, the first day on the block you go to jail, this ain't for you. And I said to myself, you know what, now I need to do something that my brothers cannot do that my relatives can't do, and I turned to writing raps. 
And I would go back in my neighborhood, go back on my block, whatever I write in my room, I would go back on my block and I would go to the drug dealers. And they would tell me to rap for them. And I should say, no, you got to give me 50 cents, a quarter, a dollar, something. And I noticed that I started hustling the hustlers. You know what I mean? They on the corner. And at that particular time back then, it wasn't like now where everybody's a rapper. <laughs> Every neighborhood has a rapper. Back then, I was considered the star of my neighborhood because there probably was only three or four other rappers in my neighborhood. So when I go out there only 12, 13 years old, and they telling me to rap, maybe younger, and I would tell them, you got to pay me. And that's the first time at a young age that I realized, I said, you know what, maybe I can make money off of this. And at that particular time, my purpose of my life at that particular time was to get out of the ghetto, get out of the hood, and make it into the music industry by any means necessary. I seen that for me, at that particular time, all my relatives going out of prison, I didn't want that. Even though I was on a block, even though I was hanging with them, even though I was committed in all the activities that goes on in the inner cities of, of, the, of America. But I realized at a young age that that would come to an end. I realized that some, unfortunately, some of us in the ghettos and some of us in the neighborhoods, they don't realize that the streets gonna come to an end until they're in prison. They don't realize that that life gonna eventually, the streets have no loyalty. But at that particular time, I thank God that I was able to see at a young age this wasn't gonna be a long, longevity. So I turned to writing raps. And I was at that particular time of my life, I used to say, I'm gonna make it in the music industry. And I remember people laughing at me. I remember going to school and teachers telling me, man, you would never be nothing in life. By the time you're 15, 16 years old, you would be dead on prison. The teachers used to tell me this as a student, as a kid. Imagine as a kid, you hear this from the people that's supposed to teach you. But I had determination because every time I go back on my block and I see what happened on my block, I used to say, there's no way I want this for my life. There's no way, man. I grew up, you know how it is in the inner city. Y'all see what happens in the neighborhoods. I used to say, man, I got to get up out of here. So eventually, I got real serious. And I ran into a childhood friend, a mother of a childhood friend of mine, Gaddafi, the mother of Gaddafi, Yafeya, who became Gaddafi and the Outlaws. And I remember I ran into her. And I haven't seen her or her son, Yafeya. We were childhood friends. I haven't seen them in years. And I asked his mom, how is everything? What's up with Yafeya? You guys know Gaddafi, right, from the Outlaws? He was, his real name is Yafeya. So I asked his mom, how's he doing? And she said he's trying to pursue a, a, a career in the rap industry. And she asked me, how was I doing what I'm up to? And I said, well, I'm also trying to be a rapper. And she said, well, listen, my son, Yafeo, he's on his way to New York City his, with his brother by the name of Tupac Shakur. And at that particular time of my life, I knew Pac, but most of the people didn't know Tupac. He only had one album out. He wasn't really buzzing on the East Coast like that, but I knew who he was. It's funny because at a, as a, at a young age, I always listened to West Coast music at that particular time. I always related to the West Coast rap. Back then, I didn't really listen to rap from the East Coast. I love rap. I love NWA. I love listening to music that I can feel like I can relate to. You know what I mean? Growing up, seeing my parents get murdered in front of me when I was three years old, seeing friends getting murdered across the street from my house, seeing my cousin bringing a 357 in when I was like eight, nine years old, I was, I was attracted to that lifestyle. So back then, West Coast music was speaking about the life that I was surrounded around, that I was, that I was around every day. So when she told me that his half-brother Tupac Shakur, I said to myself, I have to meet him. Jumped on the train. A couple weeks later, they was in New York City. I went to Manhattan, the part of New Jersey I was from was about 30, 40, 30 minutes from Manhattan. I jumped on the train. And as a youngster, you know, as a youngster, 14 years old, 13, 14 years old, and listening to Tupac on the, he was already a controversial figure at that particular time. He was already known to, you know, stir up some trouble. So when I was walking in the hotel room, I said to myself, I have to impress this dude. What can I do to make him like me how can i what type of street stories can i share with him and i remember walking in the hotel room with Pac, and i start saying you know i'm from the hood i did this i did that and he cut me off he like look i don't really want to hear all of that i was shocked because the news you know what i mean they portray him as a certain individual so Pac cut me off he said i don't really want to hear all of that type of negative stuff i'm not impressed by that he said if i'm gonna give you a chance in the music industry i need to know you ain't gonna waste my time so i knew right off the bat he was different than what the media, his music, portrayed him to be at that particular time. So a few months later, unfortunately, I got kicked out of high. I got kicked out of high school. You know, I got kicked out of high school. Got kicked out of school, 
And I said, now is either I'm gonna get in trouble, I'm gonna be on the streets, or I have to really pursue the career in the music industry. So a few months later, I got invited to Atlanta. Tupac at that particular time, he was living in Atlanta, Georgia. I got invited to Atlanta. I met up with the Outlaws. I met up at that particular time, we wasn't the Outlaws, we was called Drama Cital. Then we was called the Young Thugs. And it was myself, I was known as Little Moo back then. It was Edie, he was known as Malcolm. It was Gaddafi, he was known as Hollywood back then. <laughs> and it was Castro. And at that time, Tupac was in New York City a lot. He was spending a lot of time in New York City. And on one of his trips to New York City, he got shot. The reason why I'm telling you these scenarios and breaking down these scenes because they played a major part in my life and on my future decisions that I made. All of this stuff that I'm telling you ended up to, alhamdulillah, by Allah's permission, where I'm at today. So I want to I want to walk you guys through it step by step. So when Tupac went to New York City and he got shot five times, as you guys recall, I'm sure a lot of you heard about the story, right? Some of you youngsters wasn't even born yet, but a lot of you guys heard about the story. When, sh when Pac got shot nine times, I didn't know at that particular time, that event, that event, getting shot five times in New York City, was going to play a major role in my life, the life of Tupac and the Outlaws. In fact, it was a major role that ended Tupac life years later. So after Tupac got shot myself, I'm thinking I'm leaving the, the streets. I'm thinking that I'm leaving the streets, I'm getting into the music industry because it's going to be much safer. And I'm thinking that the music industries, I'm running away from the streets, not knowing that the music industry to me, it was probably a hundred times worse than the street at that particular time. So when Tupac got shot five times, he made it, he survived. He felt like people that was once his friends was out to kill him. And to, uh, you know, to some degree, he was 100% right with it. And he got real paranoid. People that he trusted turned his back on him. People that was close to him set him up. And his, mind state, his mindset flipped. And I, I witnessed that. I witnessed when I, I first met Pac, he was a person that was, you know, he really had a lot of love for the African-American community, for the Latino community, for the minority community in general. And I remember Pac saying after he got shot five times in that elevator, it hurt him to the point that he thought that a black person would never be the one trying to murder him. So he had to come out of that situation saying that maybe a person who looked like me is my enemy. Maybe the person who I'm doing my music for, that I'm writing these songs for, that I'm trying to uplift in the inner city community, the people that I trusted with my life are the ones that's trying to take my life. And I've seen Pop go through a struggle. I've seen him change. I've seen him go from a situation where he went, he, after getting shot and going to death row, Pop became heartless in, in, to a certain degree. But I always look at it as a protection mechanism. I look at it like from the outside looking in, when people looked at it like Pac was his troublemaker, he was running around, but they don't realize, man, he had to switch mode as a protection mechanism because he was up against a lot. But I didn't realize at that particular time, 14, 15 years old, that these effects, uh, that these events would play a major, major effect in my life. So after Pac got shot, he, went, he got arrested, spent a year and a half in prison. And at that particular time, a lot of people don't know, before Tupac signed a record deal with Death Row Records, Suge Knight always wanted to sign him. Suge Knight used to always contact Pac, man, come to Death Row. We love you over here, come to Death Row. And Pac always shunned him. He wasn't ready to go to Death Row. But when Pac was sitting in the prison, and the people he thought had his back, and the record companies that he sold millions of records for turned his back on him, the only one who stepped up was Suge Knight. The only one who stepped up and said, look here, man, I'll put up a million dollar cash to get you out of prison. And you signed to Death Row Records and your enemies will now be my enemies. It was a common, it was a common, they had something in common together. Because the people who Pac thought was trying to kill him a couple months before that, rumor was that one of Suge Knight homies that got killed in Atlanta was by the hands of these same individuals. So him and Pac was only, it was only right for them at that particular time to team up. So after Pac left, left the hospital, left prison, signed to Death Row, we moved to California. And everybody know at that particular time, man, gang banging in California was at the highest peak at the, in, a, in the late 80s and the early 90s, it was, at the, it was at its highest peak. And I remember even coming from New Jersey, we didn't, re we didn't have Instagram back then, we didn't have YouTube, we couldn't press a hashtag, what happened and back then, you had to find out the hard way. <laughs> so I remember leaving New Jersey, thinking that, you know, it was all he say, she say, it ain't really what the people say. 
You know, I didn't really think Gang Banger was really that serious of what we see on television, what these rappers say. So we left New Jersey, and I remember one particular time we wanted to go to Venice Beach to play basketball. Marcel, Fatal, Gaddafi, and we all had on red. Somebody, I, I remember I had like Nikes on with red on. And Gaddafi had some red on, and Hussein Fatal had something red on, and we playing basketball, and we noticed that people started surrounding the court. And we noticed that the people that surrounded the court look like G's, look like gangsters. But we ain't, we ain't thinking of it. We still, we from Jersey, you know what I mean? We ignorant to this stuff, so we still playing basketball. And they looking at us, they mean mugging us, and they staring at us. And one of the OG's, one of the big homies, he came up to us and said, where y'all from? We was like, we from New Jersey, you know what I mean? And he's like, yeah, I could tell the way y'all asking. You know, you don't sound like you from over here. He said, but let me tell you something, homie. <laughs> Got straight to the point. May Allah give this guy Hidayah for this. Because he was like, let me say, explain something to y'all. He said, you see them colors that you're wearing? Because we had on red. He said, those colors don't belong around here. He said, you see the homies over here? They was ready to start smoking, y'all. But I said, wait a minute. Before we do that, let me just approach these dudes. Because they don't really seem like they're from around here. He said, this neighborhood is called Venice Shoreline Crips. I didn't even know it was Crips on Venice Beach. You know, the, t the movies made us think that was Hollywood tourism. He said, man, we Venice Shoreline Crips. He said, so that color right there, you can't be over here with that color. So for me as a 14, 15 year old kid, man, we had to adapt. Like I said, we running away from, I'm running away from the streets in America, in New Jersey, not knowing that the music industry coming to the West Coast was a hundred times worse not knowing that it was a hundred times worse. So right there, we had to learn how to adapt. We had to learn, how, we had to realize that it ain't no joke over here. People really get killed because of colors in California at that particular time. Not realizing that death row, you know what I mean? You had, you had Snoop over here and Snoop, everybody know he's a crip. You had Suge homies, they all bloods, they all parus. And for some reason, we clicked and elevated towards Suge and his homies. So when we're in the studio, even though Pac was with, you know, he had Thug Life, he had Big Psych, they all Crip members. But when we was in the studio, majority of the people in the studio with us, they was affiliated one way or another to, the, to, to maybe the Bloods. So it started making tension. You know what I mean? It was tension. And that's when I started realizing, man, the, the music industry, at least, on, at least on death row, it seemed like it's worse than the streets I was running from in New Jersey. And eventually, it actually came out to be true. It actually came out be, to be true because as we know, about a year later after Tupac came to death row, he was murdered in a drive-by shooting. He was murdered in a drive-by shooting in Las Vegas, as everybody know. And that was a, a major turning point in my life and the life of the rest of the outlaws. And at this particular time in my life, I still didn't realize what, what, my, what was my purpose of life. I'm just going with the flow. So Tupac not knowing how serious it is gang banging even though i would say he wasn't a gang member but he was affiliated with most of the people probably would say he was around bloods so we're going to say he's a blood and tupac not knowing that that fight that he had with that individual that in california these people going to come back and they're going to strike hard and i guess everybody realized it can happen but we didn't realize it was going to happen that soon so imagine when you 14 15 years old at that particular time in my life Pac was like a father figure to me he was a big brother to me he, my, my grandparents entrusted me and entrusted him, entrusted me with him. You know what I mean? He told my grandparents that he gonna take care of me. And he did take care of me. 13, 14 years old, this is the individual who took care of me. So after Tupac died, we didn't really know which way to go. We didn't really know which way to turn. Some of us went back to Jersey. I went back to Jersey with Gaddafi. The first week I got back to Jersey, I got in trouble. I got locked up and I told myself, I'm leaving this place. And I went to Atlanta. And Gaddafi, my childhood friend since I was my eight, nine years old, I told him, leave New Jersey. Get up out of New Jersey. Come back with me to Atlanta. He said, you go to Atlanta, I will meet you in Atlanta in a couple weeks. Tupac died in September. November, two months later, I get a phone call while I'm in Atlanta that Gaddafi got shot. He's in the hospital. 30 minutes later, I get a phone call saying the one who shot Gaddafi was Muta cousin. Imagine how I felt. Right before I left, I introduced Gaddafi to my little cousin. I introduced him to my little cousin because my cousin, I, from my standpoint of view, my cousin was going to protect him. My cousin was always with a gun. I would have never thought that my own little cousin would turn the gun on Gaddafi at that particular time who I looked at as my best friend. So when I got the words that 
my cousin murdered, shot Gaddafi, and he died a couple days in a later, a couple days later in the hospital. I was devastated. I was numb because we just lost Tupac. A couple months before Pac, my grandmother who raised me died. Now, two months after the death of Tupac, Gaddafi died, and he got murdered by the hands of my little cousin. So I started telling myself, man, the music industry, this whole environment is more corrupt than the streets. So when Gaddafi died, and this was a time that made me the mother of Tupac, my respect level for her went out the roof because Tupac mother is the aunt of Gaddafi. So while I'm sleeping in her house and they get the phone call that Gaddafi died and he was murdered by the cousin of Muta, they never made me feel uncomfortable in that house. Gaddafi mother was calling Tupac mother saying, kick me out of the house and she stood up for me. She went against her whole family. So imagine I'm in the house, my cousin murdered their relative, and I'm sleeping there every night. This how good of this how good of the, the family, this how good people these people are. So they ne never made me feel uncomfortable. And not only that, a war was about to pop off from my block and the block of Gaddafi. A war was about to pop off. My brothers, my cousins got strapped, both sides threatening each other. Both sides calling each other. I flew to New Jersey, Gaddafi funeral. I was going to go to Gaddafi funeral. Some of his homeboys called me, threatening me, said, if you come to the funeral, it's on. One of my homies said, we going to the funeral. You're going to walk up. I'm going to have my gun out. Wallahi, these are true stories. They said, well, I'm going to have my gun out. You're going to go look at the body. The first person say something. We walking them out with the gun, and, we, and we're going to shoot them. And I said to myself, man, how can I let this happen at my man's funeral? So I, his mother called me and said, you know, Mutai, don't go to the funeral because I know something going to happen, which probably would have happened because my neighborhood wasn't letting me go to that funeral. And his homeboys look at it like since your cousin Kilkada is on. So when I didn't go to the funeral, his homies said, this is a this is more of a reality. This is more of a fact. You don't love Gaddafi because you didn't go to the funeral. So imagine what I was going through at that particular time. Imagine what I was going through. So my cousin, he was hiding out in the projects. So I found out where he was at in, in the neighborhoods. And we know that this is not something that when you're involved in the streets, you don't do this. But I felt like something, because Gaddafi was, he was considered, he was like a best friend to me. So I went, through, I went against my whole family. I went against my whole neighborhood. I went against my whole block. I went to my cousin. I said, look here, man, this is going to sound crazy, but you got to turn yourself in. You can't just be walking around, you killed Gaddafi, but it's hard for you to just something, I don't want nobody to harm you. If somebody try to harm my cousin, of course, we gonna, I'm gonna stand up for him. But you 14, 15 years old, you killed him. I think the best thing, man, go turn yourself in, handle your time like a man at least. In my mind, I can say Gaddafi family can see that it really was an accident because my cousin did it as an accident. So if you turn yourself in, the family gonna look at it like it was an accident. This way, no war will pop off. And eventually, my cousin took that advice. Did seven or eight years in prison, eight, nine, ten years in prison or something like that. Came home. And alhamdulillah, he accepted the religion of Islam. So after losing Gaddafi, losing Pac, my life, as I said, I still didn't know my purpose of life. At that particular time of my life, I became suicidal. I became the worst person that I can say. At that particular time, I was the worst person that I ever, at that time, I was the worst. I was at my worst. I was at my worst. I was my worst enemy. I was, man, every day I'm drunk, I'm high. Every day I'm leaving my house with a gun. I was the most angriest person. Man, I was, a, I, was a, I was an animal. I was an animal. I would go to nightclubs. This is how lost I was. I, I'd go to nightclubs, I would get drunk, and I would start fights. Literally. I got to the point where the outlaws, who was supposed to be a gangster rap group, the outlaws start saying, man, we're not going outside with you anymore. We tired of fighting with you, man. We tired of going outside. We tired of, I came to a point in my life, I didn't want to live anymore. You know what I mean? I didn't want to live anymore. So I used to say, I'm going to do whatever it takes for somebody to kill me. I used to ride around, man, a brand new Lexus. You know, when Lexus came out with the, hard, the convertible hard top, you, you press the button and they go in the trunk. I was the first one in LA, one of the first ones in LA with that joint. And I used to ride around with an AK-47 in the back trunk. And I used to see people on the corner and jump out on the corner with my jewelry on, a gun in my way. I used to say, please try to rob me. This is my mindset. Well, like, 
I said, I hope these dudes try to rob me today. Like I was looking for a reason to harm someone. That's because I was so hurt, going through so much pain, but I didn't know how to channel it. You didn't, I didn't know how to channel. I didn't know to turn to my creator and ask for guidance. I didn't know my purpose of life. So I used to think that since I'm hurt, I want to put somebody else through that pain. This was my mindset. And I think when I started to ease down, when I had my first son, you know, when I had my first son a couple years later, I started to really relax a little bit and say, now I don't want to raise my kids the way that I was raised. But I still at that particular time didn't know guidance. I still didn't know my purpose of life. So I still was a wild dude. You know what I mean? I was I put myself in so many situations that I look back now and I say, wow, that was God. I was in situations, man, where bullets was coming past, like literally, I lost my witness, bullets passing my head, my air, I'm feeling it, and going past me, and I survive. Now that I look back at that and I realize that all this time that I was lost, Allah was so merciful, merciful to me, he had me when I didn't even have myself. He was merciful towards me, he was caring about me when I didn't even care about myself. I look back at it and say, man, so many times that I was in a situation, but Allah helped me and I didn't even know. I didn't even realize it because I didn't know my purpose in life. So eventually I continued to do music. And I got to a point in my life where I started experimenting with different drugs. I didn't want to leave the house sober. I became hardcore alcoholic, literally, like I was going with it. You would never catch me walking out of my house normal. Like every day I left my house, I had to be in a state of mind because I was in denial the way I was living my life. And not only that, when we started selling records with the outlaws and we started making millions of dollars and we started making hundreds of thousands to millions of dollars, I became more depressed and more unhappy. When I started realizing that these homes is not bringing my happiness, purchasing a new car wasn't bringing my happiness, the jewelry wasn't bringing my happiness. At that particular time, I started to question life. I started to sit in my room every night before I go to sleep and I say, man, it have to be more than life than this. I'm sitting here in a four or five bedroom house, but I'm unhappy. I was more happy back home in poverty, living in the, in the ghetto. I'm like, I got a brand new $80,000 car outside, but I'm unhappy. I got to drink alcohol just to fall asleep. This is my reality. I wake up the next day and I, I think of stuff that I done last night and I say, oh man, I can't believe I done that. Let me get drunk, let me, let me forget about it. This was the cycle of life that I was living. So I said, man, what's the purpose of living? What's the purpose of living? I said to myself, man, you did it. You sold records. You, at one particular time in my life, I had three houses. Three houses. I stay in one house for a year and be like, man, I need to go get another house. But I was searching because I didn't know the purpose of life. So I was searching in all the wrong areas, all the wrong places, trying to find happiness. Didn't know that all I had to do was submit to my creator. Simple. No money. Don't need to harm myself. So one day I happened to be in a recording studio. And I was drunk out of my mind. I got to a fight with my little brother. Same mother, same father. And we got to a fight and he had to go to the hospital to get staples in his head. And it was a Muslim brother from Los Angeles, came up to me, broke the fight up, asked my name, and we started conversating. And as the brother said in my documentary, the brother said to me, when he found out that was my brother, he said, man, when he looked at the blood on the ground, he said, man, that's the blood of your mother and father on the ground. And for me growing up without a mother and father, that touched me. And that touched me. Like I'm at a situation where I would kill my own brother, literally almost killed my own brother. That I flew from New Jersey, that I told my grandmother, send him out here when he was getting in trouble, send him out here, I'm gonna protect him. And I got to the point where I was almost gonna murder my own little brother, that's when I said, man, I, I'm lost. But I still don't know where to get guidance from. I'm thinking when you come from this environment, you know what I mean? We think that this all life have to offer us. And that's how so many people throw their lives away. Because we come in from environments, especially in the inner cities and these ghettos, and we think all life has to offer us is what's around us. We become a product of our environment. And we think that, okay, my whole family selling drugs, my whole, all my friends going to jail, so this have to be what's written for me. You know what I mean? This have to be what's written for me. And that's what I was thinking. So I would say to myself, man, but at the end of the day, man, I know it have to be more than life than this. I know it have to be more than this, but I didn't know. So this brother, we exchanged phone numbers and every day he would call me to the masjid. Come to the masjid, come check it out. Like I told you, I thought Muslims murdered my mother and father. I ain't want nothing to do with Muslims. But one day I was like, you know what, man, this dude ain't gonna stop calling me until I go to that masjid. I want this dude to stop calling me. This was my intention. I said, you know what, I'm coming to the masjid today. 
I called the homies. I remember I went up, and he said it. I went up there about 30 deep. 30 deep, had my gun on me, because I ain't know what, I, I ain't trust none of them jokers. I thought, man, it was crazy. I said, I'm going up there with my gun, and it was in South Central LA. I remember pulling up my Lexus, and I sat, I remember people coming in on bikes, people walking in the mad shit, and I'm thinking like, wait a minute, these people don't look like they have the money I have, but they look, everyone look happy. Some of these people don't even have vehicles, don't even have cars. But I'm like, why the hell is they smiling? I'm envy because I have houses, I have money, I had jewelry, but in my, house, in, my, in my side, inside of me, I was conflicted, I was unhappy. So I said, you know what, let me go inside the mad shit. I walked inside of the mosque, and I seen people embracing me, how's everything? Embracing, embracing each other, salam alaikum, hugging each other. And I'm just paying attention, I'm like, man, this is awkward. You know what I mean? They, they showing love to each other. Prayer time came. And the brother was like, you should pray with us. You know what I mean? I was like, I don't know how to pray, man. He like, no, nah. he was forceful, like pushing me. Like, just pray with us, whatever. You know what I mean? You see us do, you do. But when you put your face on the floor, you praying to God, whatever you want, ask God. So I went, on, I went ahead and I joined him in prayer. And I put my face on the floor and I remember the prayer that I made was, oh God, just guide me to a way of life that's going to bring me happiness. That's all I wanted at that particular time was happiness. Because I had the money, I had the cars, I had the fame, but I didn't have any happiness. I didn't have no tranquility, I didn't have any peace. So I made that prayer, God just guide me to a way of life that's going to bring me happiness. And after the prayer, the brother gave me literature, English translation of Quran. He gave me some literature of the religion of Islam. I drove home and I just couldn't stop reading. You know, I grew up, my grandmother was like hardcore Christian, like... She was a good woman, but she was serious with her religion. So she used to sit around, read the Bible all day, force us to go to church. And she used to say names like David and Isaac, Jacob, Abraham. So I remember reading the pamphlets of the religion of Islam, and I'm reading these names, that they are prophets of God. I'm like, damn, these are names that my grandmother used to teach me about. And then when it got to the prophet Muhammad, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, it started explaining that he was the last messenger and the last prophet of God. And I started to read, the more that I read, the more that it was clear to me that the reason why I, was, I wasn't happy is because I didn't know my purpose of life. And as I mentioned earlier, Allah says in the Quran that he created mankind and jinn to worship him. And when we mean worship him, it doesn't mean that, like I said, we pray to him 24-7, we don't live our life. No, worship him in everything we do. The way we treat our parents, the way we treat ourselves, the, what, the food that we put in our bodies, all of this is worship. The, the way that we make our money, this is worship. You understand? The way everything the Muslim do in our life is going to be for us or against us. And I started realizing the way that I was living my life, the reason why I was happy, because I was, fur I was a the furthest away from this. And I called the brother, I said, you know what, I need this in my life. I need to accept this religion of Islam, because it was clear to me. It was clear to me that I wasn't praying and, and worshiping my creator, so this is why I wasn't happy. So after accepting the religion of Islam, I started to realize it was like a veil was lifted over my eyes. It was like a veil was lifted over my eyes that I was realizing like that I lived my life wrong all, this, all these years. All these years I thought that I could make my own rules up and I could live by them. All these years I thought that I can do whatever I want with no consequences. And I realized when I did live my life like that, as they say freedom, I was unhappy. When it was the so-called freedom that everybody want, the so-called freedom of life, and they say Islam restricted, it's a restricted life. How can you be a Muslim? It's a restricted life, but it's restricting you from what? It's restricting you from what? Harming your own self? Everything that the religion of Islam tells us to stay away from is only for our own benefit. It's only for our own good. So I realized that the way that I was living my life, I was no different than an animal. I realized that I thank God for guiding me and finally letting me realize my purpose of life. And I was able to, and I was able to be guided, and I was able to come to this life without dying in that. You know how many people died in them? You know how many of my loved ones died? Man, there was times that people had guns pointed in my face. Pointed in my face. I'm not going to say the name, the bodyguard of a certain rapper pointed in my face. And I used to say, man, this is, this is it. This is the time I can lead this life. That's how unhappy I was. And I said, after accepting the religion of Islam, I thank Allah you didn't take my life then. I thank Allah you didn't take my life when I was misguided and I was upon darkness. Thank you Allah for saving me all this time. So we have to realize the purpose of life 
is to worship our creator. Allah created us to worship him and we will not have a peaceful, tranquil, tranquil life until we worship our Lord. Very simple, very simple. The entertainers, we want you to believe that you have to live this certain lifestyle in order to find your happiness. But sit down with these, sit down with them, have a conversation. You'll realize the reason why they high and they drunk is because they in denial. They're trying to escape from something. Temporary, they trying to escape and these things will take you away temporarily. But then when you sober up, you back to your reality. You back to the reality. The further we away from Allah, the unhappy we are. This is the reality, man. I lived both lives. I was able to experience it. I was able to accept the religion of Islam and walk away from everything. I, I walked away from everything, from my houses, from my money, from my cars. I was sleeping on my brother floor at one particular time. Everybody around me was like, this dude crazy. Everybody around me thought I lost my mind, but I knew Allah promised it was the hot. I said, man, I don't want this money anymore. I don't want this lifestyle anymore. Alhamdulillah, Allah took me away from it. I was sleeping on my brother. My brother used to come and say, man, is you crazy? How you living your life like this? How you living your life like this? But I realized, I realized, alhamdulillah, Allah's promise is true. I was able to get back on my feet step by step. And I'm glad that Allah took me through this. I'm glad that I went through hardship. Man, I went from homes to one day having nothing. And guess what? I always tell people that was the best time of my life. Wallahi. When I lost everything, it was the best time of my life because I was able to find out who I really is on the inside. And I was able to see who really had my back. Man, that got to the point, man, when my, my son Muhammad was only six months old, in order for me to buy Pampers, I used to go into my brother's couch, and I used to look for change just to buy Pampers. And I remember before that, I used to get checks for $500, $1,000, $1,500, and I didn't even go to, I wouldn't even cash them in the bank. I used to say, man, this ain't no money. I ain't, wait, I ain't waiting in no line till in the bank to cash this. And I remember at that particular time, I was like, damn, where them checks at? Where them checks at? But it was the best time of my life because I was able to do everything halal. I was able, I started off, I started off selling oil. I go in front of the magic, sell oil. I take that money, buy some clothes, sell clothes. Everybody was laughing at me. Family members, friends, like this dude lost his mind. I was able to do, I remember, man, if I, didn't, I lost my cars, I lost my homes. And when I was going through that stage, I remember I got my first rental car. Before that, you want to, you want to catch me dead in that car, man. Like that's how arrogant I was. I, I used to only believe that I, a, my standard of life, my standard was living had to be on the top. But when you hit rock bottom and I made it my first couple hundred dollars and I was able to get a rental car, man, I was driving that joint like a Benz. Eventually I saved more money. I remember going to get my own apartment and I didn't even have furniture. Me and my wife and my son were sleeping on the floor. And I remember I felt like I was in a castle. I'm glad that Allah took me through these things step by step. Step by step, I walked away and I had to tell myself I can do it. I had, I had to tell myself I don't have to do what everybody else want me to do. My whole family, everybody think I'm crazy. They want me to stay in the music industry. I'm going to prove to them I don't need that. When everybody's like, why are you walking away from the music? How are you going to survive? I said, I'm going to do it. I was walking around with those because I lost all my clothes. I remember I, sent, I was trying to go to Saudi, sent everything to Saudi back then, lost everything. Walking around with thobes on. Everybody was like, man, this dude really crazy now. This before the rappers was putting on thobes, going to Dubai, taking selfies. You know what I mean? This before that was happening. So I was able to go through all of that. Alhamdulillah, now I can say that my patience or whatever from Allah's mercy, I won't even say my patience because I know I fell short many times. And I know it's because I know I have, I, I know I have, mashallah, may Allah forgive me, probably more shortcomings than everybody in this room put together. So I know it's not from anything that I did good, but I know it's from Allah's rahmah, his mercy, that he was able to allow me to get back on my feet. Now today, alhamdulillah, by Allah's permission, I have my own business. I was able to go from making, I might not have the money that I had before, but when you make money halal, it's barakah in it, it lasts, it goes a long way. And I know it's from Allah's rahmah, his mercy. That Allah promises true that if you leave something, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam say, if you leave something for the sake of Allah, he give you something better in return. I don't have to look behind my shoulders. I don't have to, I don't, when I go to sleep, when I walk down the street, I live in Saudi Arabia now for nine years. One day I was in Saudi Arabia and I was walking up the block and I heard somebody running behind me. And he ran right past me. And I was like, SubhanAllah, I didn't even turn around. That's how safe this country is. If this is America, I would have turned around with my gun out. You know what I mean? I said, SubhanAllah. 
Look at the mercy of Allah. Individual running behind me, I didn't even, subhanAllah. These are things money can't buy. I can look at my kids, they speak Arabic. Alhamdulillah, my kids speak Arabic. They learn the religion of Islam. These are things, money. I can look at my kids by Allah's permission. Even, alhamdulillah, even if I didn't have businesses, even if I didn't have anything, I can look at my kids and say, by Allah's permission, I'm not raising them the way I was raised. That alone right there, money can't buy. To look at my kids, they 13, 14 years old, and they innocent. When I was 13 years old, man, I was on a block selling cocaine. Cocaine. My kids, 13, 14 years old, go to school, come back, open their books, alhamdulillah. Writing in Arabic, alhamdulillah. I say that alone, money cannot buy. Thank you, thank you Allah for that. That I got an opportunity to not raise my kids. Man, I was dysfunctional. I seen a picture of me the other day, one of my brothers sent me, I was maybe four or five years old. They, I was drinking beer, stuck for the law. Wallahi, one of my relatives, I'm half Puerto Rican, half African American. I believe this was the Puerto Rican side of the family. <laughs> they gave me some Puerto Rican rum and they taking pictures laughing. I look at this, I say, subhanAllah. My kids don't know these things. My kids don't know these things. But Allah's permit, this is a rock, my mercy. So we have to thank Allah that, alhamdulillah, man, that we guided to this religion. That you have parents, alhamdulillah, that you have parents that did their best to keep you on the right track. That most of your parents that came from Kurdistan, Somalia, Yemen, or these other countries or whatever, that they, in most cases, came here to give you a better life. So how would you feel? Do you really think Allah would be pleased with you that you turn around and you end up in the streets and you being corrupt and you causing your parents headache? You really think Allah would be pleased with you? You really think that Allah would be pleased with you that your parents migrated over here and all of a sudden you on the corner gang banging or whatever? No, you're not going to get barakah in that life. You ain't going to get no blessings. So when you hear your parents saying, stay away from this and that, and we be thinking that they don't know what they, trust me, they know, especially if they come from Kurdistan, man, they probably had some rocket missiles running down the street at one particular time in their life. So they know, you know what I mean? They know, so take heed. But alhamdulillah, to end the talk until we go, after this we go to a break, that one thing we have to realize that Allah is Gafur Rahim, He's the most merciful. No matter how many sins we committed, no matter how many shortcomings, we have a Lord that is the most merciful, Gafur Rahim. The, just think about that, that there's nothing we can do that Allah will not forgive us if we ask Him. Nothing we can do that Allah will not forgive us if we ask Him. That's how merciful He is. The Prophet said in a narration one time that there was a lady who, who lost her child. And she was frantic searching for her child. If I'm not mistaken, it was in Medina. And she was looking for her child. What happened to my child? And when she finally found the baby, she grabbed the baby. And the first thing she did is put the baby to the chest to start feeding the baby. Happiness. The Prophet Wasallam looked at the companions. He said, do you think that woman would throw her child in the fire? And they said, not by her own will. The Prophet Wasallam said, Allah is more merciful to you than that woman is to her own child. Think about that. Your mother would never throw you in the fire. Allah is more merciful to us than our own mother, than our own parents. That alone should let us know that if Allah is so merciful, He's so kind to us, we should try our best to obey Him. Try our best. We're going to fall short. We're going to slip. We're going to make mistakes. But He is Gafur Rahim. We make toba. We repent. We ask Allah to forgive us. He promised He will forgive us. Some of us don't even repent. Don't never let the shaitan, because some of the shaitan come to you and say, why are you going to repent to Allah when you're going to fall into that sin again? This is one of the biggest tricks that the shaitan get mankind with. You're going to fall into that sin again. Somebody came to Ali ibn Abi Talib and said it, that they would fall into that sin and repent. And, and what happened if I repent and fall into the sin again? He said, repent again. What happened if I fall into the sin? Repent again. Until the shaitan is overpowered, till he defeated. We never give up doing Tawbah. Because Allah would never stop forgiving us. Sometimes we think that, man, we did so much stuff. It ain't, I'm not even going to ask Allah because I'm going to do it again tomorrow. That's how the shaitan wants. That's how he wants us to, to lose. No matter what we do, no matter how many times we do, man, don't stop making toba. May Allah forgive our sins. May Allah give us tawfiq. Jazakum Allah khair for your time. After the break, we go into Q&A, inshallah. Thank you.